Hi, welcome to the next video where we're going to be talking about bond pricing and why bonds might be priced at something different than their par value, different than that amount that was written on the front of the bond. We'll also talk about why this guy is actually pretty dang smart and why you should be following his social media feed. My name's Kyle and I'm your Corona accountant. All right, so this is a chart that we had from uh, the last class and in this chart, uh, we, we talked mainly about par value uh, for coupon rates. Recall that bonds have two features. They have the par value and they have this coupon rate. And the par value is a fixed payment at the end. And the coupon rate, while it has a percentage on there, is a fixed percentage throughout the duration of the contract. So the contract, the, the bond, is has a fixed amount of payments and cash flows. Now, these pieces of paper end up being sold on a market. We showed you some of this before. This is an example of trading pits uh, that have been depicted in movies and different things. This is the way bonds used to get traded. What happens, uh, and, and this is how all securities are, are traded. Uh, secu securities have a fixed contract, fixed value that they represent. And in these markets, what happens is, is people trade with each other and negotiate on price. They're actually it's, an, it's not like this is what it's worth. It's all these people are always arguing with what price, what they can get for what amount in different places. And the negotiation across the price is actually what's happening in these markets when you see the chaos. When you see this happening, uh, contracts are being, well, not that, that's from Ferris Bueller's day off. He's doing little signals, but they have all these signals that they used to do. Um, and they're trading contracts with each other and securities with each other, and they're negotiating on the price. You might be wondering, well, how could there be a different price based on the cash flows? It depends on how risky the individual is. So let me give you a hypothetical. Say you had an opportunity to buy two securities with given cash flows, cash flows from two, two different people. We're going to have me, Kyle Welch, be one of them. Kyle Welch, the untenured faculty uh, at George Washington University. Uh, he's, he teaches accounting using a meth lab. He has five kids there's some uncertainty about his future. All right, and let's compare him to say another faculty, Suk Young King. Suk Young, he's been at George Washington University for years. He has tenure, which means he has a guaranteed job at George Washington University. He does well, he's done a lot of service in the community, his income is pretty well set. Whereas Kyle's, not so much, he doesn't have tenure, he's trying to get tenure, doesn't have tenure at GW yet. Uh, another factor is, so Kyung, he doesn't have five kids. He said all his kids are moved out. So if you had a contract written by So Kyung and Kyle, you'd have a debate. You'd say, okay, well, which one is the more riskier asset? I think it's pretty clear. I'm more risky. If we both had the same contract with the same cash flow for payment, you might consider paying more for So Kyung's than you would for mine. Alternatively, you might say, well, if I'm going to pay this for Suck Young's, Kyle's is definitely something. Even though it's the same cash flows going out, Kyle's got a lot of risks. He's got a lot of kids. A lot of things can happen in his life. You know, who knows based on how he's teaching. So as a result, you might pay a little less for that future payment if you were to buy it. This is the same principle with bonds. Let's look at another example. So instead of people, let's look at corporations. Um, we have two different companies that are looking to raise capital. And let's, it, coronavirus has been in the news a lot. And let's assume two different companies are, are issuing this debt, all right, issuing these bonds. Uh, and the two companies, one will be Amazon and the other will be Disney, all right? Now, if you look at Amazon uh, year to date, uh, and this is 2020, Amazon is actually up on the year. Uh, they haven't had, they haven't, things have gone actually kind of well for them. Uh, compared to the market, especially the market's down 30 plus percent and Amazon is trucking along because people have to actually buy online. And usually Amazon is the name of the game when it comes to buying online. Now, comparing Amazon to Disney, Disney's down about 50 percent. They've lost half their value. Nobody can go to these theme parks. Nobody can go on cruise trip ships. Everybody's locked in. The only thing they really have is the home media and Disney plus that's been released. And so they've been having a really, really, really rough year. And so if you had your choice between Disney and Amazon, which would you choose as far as being more risky? 
Now, there's a lot of other factors that go in there, and this is simplifying a fair amount. If you were comparing Amazon and Disney, if they both issue debt at the same time, charge a lower rate for Amazon than you would for Disney. You compare what the market rate is for a comparable of the similar risk. And right now, Disney has a lot more risk in their future as far as what they'll be able to do in their cash flows than Amazon does. And so as a result, the two of them have a different risk category if we were to use their stock to adjust for risk. So what would we do for the bond? Well, if they're issuing a bond, we would pay more for the bond of Amazon than we would pay for Disney. We would we want a discount on the bond because we don't know. So how does this play in to bonds and these bond markets where everybody's yelling at each other and changing prices? Well, if you think about it, that coupon rate, that fixed payment that you have, that percentage, that has an implied, an implicit interest rate, but that might not represent the risk. If the risk of the firm is lower, so the Amazon example, right? So if the risk of, or the Sukyong example, if the risk of the organization is lower, people are gonna pay more for it. And if they wanna pay more and more being they price it higher than the par value of the bond, what that indicates is that the coupon payment is actually more than enough to compensate for the risk. And so there will be a premium to the bond, right? Now it's hard to think about because a premium to the bond will have a lower interest rate. What? Yeah, a premium to a bond will have a lower interest rate. And the reason why is because that price is bid up. And because that upfront cost is bid up, those fixed payments, the implied return on those is much lower. So the implied interest that somebody's getting from it because they're paying more than the par value makes it so that it's issued at a premium and the interest rate, the implicit, the, the interest rate the, the, for the market rate of interest for the actual loan goes down. So the coupon payment stays the same, always stays the same. That terminal payment of it, that stays the same. What changes is that price. And as a result of that price changing, the implied market rate changes. And so if it's uh, something that's worth more or something where investors are willing to pay more to have, have a return that is less risky, what the cash flows represent there, it'll be issued at a premium. If the, it's the other situation. If it's a Kyle Welch or a Disney right now, who knows? If you're watching this in the future, I don't know what happened to Disney after coronavirus. We're in the thick of it right now. So uh, if it's Kyle or Disney, you, there's some uncertainty there. And so if there's some uncertainty and the cash flow payments that are implied in the bond, the coupon payments, if those don't actually capture the amount of risk or the dollar amount that you, you should be paid for getting a bond with Disney or with Kyle, then you would say, I think I'm going to pay less. You know what? I'm not going to pay that much for it. I'm not going to pay what you have on the price of it. I'm going to pay a little bit less. I don't, I don't want to have it. And the reason why is because it, the cash flows don't compensate you enough. And so the way you make up for being compensated for that risk is you offer a lower amount. And so that's the nature and the dynamic between the coupon rate, the market rate, and whether or not a bond sells at a premium, par, or discount. If the coupon rate matches the market rate, it's sold at par. The rate implicit in the bond, the coupon rate, represents the actual uh, return that the market demands for a business for the risk that the business is, it will be issued at par. It will have this coupon rate is going to equal to the par rate. So it'll be priced at par, right? Now, if it is at, uh, if the price is higher, if the price actually is higher uh, and the people pay more dollars for it, what's going to happen is the market rate the implied market rate, the market is saying, look, you're giving us 10% in the coupon rate, but you know what? You're an 8% business as far as the return, uh, the risk profile you have. You're not that risky. You're not a 10% risk. You're an 8% risk. And so they're going to pay more for it. And so they're going to pay a premium. That premium that they pay, this amount, this dollar amount that's going up, it's going to cause this market interest rate to be lower than the coupon rate. 
if they, the, you know, the Disney or the Kyles of the world, if they say, you know what, you know what, you're giving us 10%, but you're way riskier than that. If they do that, then they're going to say, we're not going to offer you as much money. We're going to offer you less. We're going to offer you less cash. And we'll put more up here. Or we'll offer you less cash. And as a result of offering less cash, they're going to pay a price discount, a discount to it. And by paying less, they're going to get a higher return. The market's going to get the return they require for a given level of risk that a business has. They're not just not going to buy it if it's not meeting that risk. Why would they not do it? Because they have alternative investments that they can make that were a better risk return trade-off. So as a result, they'll pay less. And so the coupon rate stays the same, but the implied rate of return is higher. Now you have to remember, this is, this is a rate of return. And so you just you don't always want to buy the bond at a disc, the, the bonds with the discount. You always want everything at a discount, but you, the discount represents the risk. It represents the risk implicit in the bond. So the bond will be sold at a discount and the market rate of interest will be higher than the coupon rate. All right. So now that we have this, let's talk about. Now that we have this, let's talk about this guy. guy his name is Mohammed El Aran, big investment guru, uh, runs. Pimco, um, and you might see him on CNBC. He had a real interesting LinkedIn post a few days ago. I saw it and I reposted it because I thought it was so, it was very insightful. You see here, so he posted a chart of the U.S. treasuries. The Fed was purchasing a lot of treasuries. They were buying them. And so as a result of buying them, they were going to pay more than what the market rate of interest was to bring interest rates down. They were paying a premium to bring bond rates down, all right? So this is during the coronavirus where they're just spending a ton of money buying these bonds to keep rates down so that there's more capital uh, in the market. You'll learn about that a bit more in another class. So this is what he posted. He said, of the many stunning charts of today's market moves, this one is among the most concerning for the health of markets and the economy. The surge in US Treasury yields has happened during a massive risk off day when the Fed is expanding its balance sheet. Think about that. What he's saying is the Fed is injecting about 1.5 trillion to prevent unusual disruptions in the market. Injecting, meaning they're buying these T-bills. They're buying them. And what we just learned is, is that when people pay a premium for an asset, the rates should go down. Here's what's so crazy. They're doing the biggest buyback that I think the Fed has ever ever done. They're buying more and more of these bonds. And based on what you just learned in this class, what happens when people, the, the bonds are in higher demand and people are paying more for them? What happens is that the, the rate, the implicit interest rate, the implied interest rate goes down, right? There's the coupon payment that stays the same, but people are paying a premium for it. So the rate should go down. The Fed is injecting 1.5 trillion into the market to buy back their treasury bonds. And this is what he noticed. Look at what's happening to the bond yields. They're going up during that day. That's scary. Why is it so scary? The Fed is buying back these securities at massive rates. They're buying them at such a high volume. But the problem is, is that there are more people wanting to sell them than to buy them. And so as a result, whatever rate they're paying for them. There are more people on the market trying to sell them and get rid of them than are buying them. And so as a result, the rates are going up, not down. And so that's a problem. Instead of buying more and there's a premium on these bonds, there are more people selling them because the demand for cash is so strong that they actually, the rates, the, the rates are instead of going down are going up because instead of buying them at a premium, there's more sellers. And so all the Fed's doing is buying them and the rate still is climbing. That's scary. So the Fed was intending to purchase a lot of those bonds and to bring rates down. This is the market rate. They wanted these rates to go down. They wanted the implied rate to go down by paying a premium on these bonds and going to the market and buying them. Instead, Rates are going this way, all right? The rates are increasing, and it's because they can't buy them faster than people are selling them. Pretty interesting. So 
That's what we have for explaining bonds issued at pr uh, premium, discount, and at par, all right? Hopefully this was helpful. We're gonna go into using your calculator in the next video for pricing premium, par, and discount, and how you actually just do the calculation in the calculator. See you next video.